Hello, everyone, and welcome to Vantage. Uh, today, we will just wait a minute to let a few more people enter the waiting room. All right, I hope you're enjoying this beginning of fall day. And today, we're really happy to have Arul Shankar speaking about ordering elliptic curves by their conductors. And Arul, is it okay for us to post this talk to YouTube afterwards? Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much, Rachel and Drew, uh, for inviting me to talk. And thank you so much to all of you for coming. It's a real pleasure to be talking. So um, <clears throat> everything, well, not, I mean, like all the results that I talk about are sort of attribute, but this is all based on joint work with, with Anand Shankar and Xiao Heng Wang. Um, so let's, let's get started. So as in the rest of the series, we're going to be working with the family of all elliptic curves, and I'll denote that by math galley. And you can write all elliptic curves of a Q as EAB, uh, Y squared equals X cubed plus AX plus B, where A and B are, in, are integers. Um, so you have to actually assume that, that, that the cubic polynomial X cubed plus AX plus B has distinct roots. Um, but in order to make sure that all the different elliptic curves uh, are different, we have to also assume that if p to the four divides b, then if p to the four divides a, then p to the six does not divide b for every prime p. So once we have this family of elliptic curves, we've talked about a lot of, we've seen a lot of different conjectures in these series of talks. Uh, I just want to mention the sort of one of the foundational conjectures in this field, which is the conjecture of Goldfeld and Katsanak, which is that 50% of elliptic curves have rank zero and 50% have rank one. Now, um, this is not a stated, a precise conjecture because E is an infinite set and I have to tell you how the curves are ordered before I start talking about statistical questions like 50%. Like 50 and normally what we do is we pretend, normally what we do is we order the elliptic curves by height, but it's not, um, but like, but but I want to sort of make the case that ordering them by conductors even is 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 also a very natural thing to do, and so I just want to talk about how these conjectures were formulated. The, these conjectures were formulated as follows: so, given any elliptic curve over Q, you can attach an L function to it, and this L function, uh, and these conjectures were actually formulated by studying the family of L functions. So the, so the point is that if you want to study the rank of an elliptic curve, the Birch and Swinnerton Dye conjecture will tell us that the rank is equal to the analytic rank, well, when the, where the analytic rank is just the order of vanishing of the L function at the critical point. So these conjectures were formulated by studying the family of L functions, by studying how the analytic rank are distributed in these families, and then using BSD to deduce how the algebraic rank is distributed. And in fact, a lot of the sort of results on average rank and so on were first proved on the level of analytic ranks. Um, so studying, so, so I mean, like it, it makes a lot of sense to not just study this family of elliptic curves, but actually to also study the associated family of L functions. And the most natural way to order L functions is by their conductors. And the conductor of an, of, of, so, so it also so it, it makes a lot of sense to order the family of elliptic curves by conductor as well. So now let me tell you what the conductor of an elliptic curve is. I mean, defining it as the conductor of the associated L function is perhaps not the easiest way uh, for computational purposes. Um, but but here's how you compute the conductor of an elliptic curve. So let's say you have an elliptic curve y squared equals f of x equals x cubed plus ax plus b. So before I tell you what the conductor is, I want to tell you what the discriminant is. Um, the discriminant of an elliptic curve, so everything I say actually today is going to be away from the primes two and three. Everything I write is going to be correct only up to factors of powers of two and powers of three. So, the, so, the, so up, to, up, up to powers of two and three, the discriminant of the elliptic curve is just equal to the discriminant of this cubic polynomial f, which is just minus four a cubed minus 27 b squared. Um, in particular, so I mean, the discriminant, uh, 
detects whether the roots of the polynomial are distinct. And in particular, P divides the discriminant, so the discriminant vanishes mod P if and only if F has a multiple root R mod P. And what we're going to do is we're going to define the P part of the conductor, CP of E, to be P if this multiple root is a double root, and P squared if this multiple root is a triple root. So an equivalent way of saying this is simply that if E has multiplicative reduction at P, we define CP of E to be P. And when E has additive reduction at P, we define CP of E to be P squared. And once we have this quantity CP, of course, we just define the conductor multiplicatively. The conductor of E is just the product over all primes P dividing the discriminant CP of E. So one of the things that I will note is that, um, is that the conductor divides the discriminant because when you have a double root at F, then P divides the discriminant. And when you have a triple root at F mod P, P, P squared divides the discriminant. So it is certainly true that the conductor divides the discriminant, but the conductor doesn't at all have to be equal to the discriminant. I mean, like P to the 100 could divide the discriminant, but only P or P squared is going to divide the conductor. OK. So now I want to talk about what's expected. So what we are interested in doing here is we're interested in studying the asymptotics of the number of elliptic curves when ordered by discriminant. So we'll define that as you know the number of E in script E such that delta E is less than X. And I should have put absolute value symbols there, sorry. Um, otherwise, this is going to be an infinite set. Um, and also studying the number of elliptic curves with bounded conductor. So studying the number of studying asymptotics of, 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 the, of, of these two quantities. The number of elliptic curves discriminant less than x and the number of elliptic curves with conductor less than x. OK, so let's start with the first quantity, n delta of x. And here's what's known. So, so basically, so actually, let me just switch to one note so I can just draw the picture of what is happening when we're trying to order elliptic curves by discriminant. So here's what's going on. I'm just going to draw one quadrant of it. I'll draw minus a here and I'll draw b here. And if we are trying to graph the quantity discriminant of e a b less than x, we'll get something which looks like this. We'll get a non-compact set. So this is what discriminant of a comma b less than x looks like. And this is a non-compact set. And in fact, this is going to contain this, this region inside R2 is going to contain infinitely many, infinitely many integer points. But all those integer points are going to lie on the discriminant equals 0 locus. So you are actually going to get an infinite set of integer points. But they'll all lie on the, sort of, on the red curve. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to take this region inside R2. We're trying to re we, we will remove the red curve. And we want to count the number of integer points inside there. And that is what n delta, uh, n delta x looks like. And the conjecture, due to Brumer and McGuinness, is that the number of integer points is actually still going to be well approximated by the volume of this region. The point is that after, after a while, like at this region becomes extremely thin. This region still does have finite volume. Uh, and at some point, like the volume, like past some point, the volume is much, much less than one. And what we expect is that there, there are no points. There are no integer points in this region uh, once, once this sort of volume becomes small enough. So the conjecture, due to Brumer and McGuinness, is that n delta x grows like the volume of all integer points a comma b in r squared with delta a b less than x. I'm really sorry, I should have said discriminant of a b not equal to 0. We have to multiply by a zeta 10 inverse because of our assumption that if p to the 4 divides a, then p to the 6 does not divide b for all primes p. So this is sort of a very natural conjecture to make. And um, in fact, this volume is known to like you can compute the volume and this is what it looks like. It scales with x and, and, and it's 
it scales as x to the five by six. So we expect n delta x e to grow like this very specific constant times x to the five by six. Okay. Um, so in particular, you can you can you can see that the number of elliptic curves ordered by discriminant is is expected to be very close to the number of elliptic curves ordered ordered by height. They have the same they have the same growth of x to the five by six. Okay. However, unlike when ordering by height, even finiteness is not immediate. Like for all we know, there could be infinitely many points, even with non-zero discriminant inside that inside that region, and to even to prove finiteness, you require some sort of diffeant and input. But for example, Ziegel's theorem on the finiteness of integer points on elliptic curves would be enough to, to deduce that n delta x e is, is finite. But, but you, need some, you need some extra input. And, and, and so you can see that studying asymptotics of n delta is going to be significantly harder than studying asymptotics when ordering by height. Okay, so next, what I want to do is talk about ordering elliptic curves by conductor, and I want to talk about heuristics for that. So here's how we're going to set that question up. So we want to understand um, the number of, we want to understand this quantity NCX, which is, which sort of computes the number of, ellip, which, which, study, which, which is the number of elliptic curves with conductor less than X. Now here's the issue. I mean, C is not a sort of polynomial function in A and B. So it's, it's, it's I mean, the set A comma B where C A B less than X is, is not something that can be studied as simply as just drawing a region in the plane and counting integer points inside there. Uh, but to get a handle on it, what we will do is we will partition, we will partition this uh, set of elliptic curves into a union uh, EN where EN are those elliptic curves where the discriminant divided by the, by the conductor is exactly N. And once we have that, then we will note that if E is in EN, then the conductor being less than X is exactly the same as the discriminant being less than NX. And so what we have is that, is that the number of elliptic curves with conductor less than X, we can break that up into the sum over all N and we get it's the sum over all n, so we have to sum n delta nx e times the probability that e is in en. So ncx is the same as summation n greater than equal to one, uh, n delta nx e. So we've 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 increased our discriminant. However, we want to restrict to counting points in the second sum that are not just in e but are actually in en. And we expect that to just be a sort of probabilistic condition. We expect that to just, you know, it's, it, that's defined by congruence conditions modulo n. So we just expect to be able to multiply that by some, by some constant. Uh, this constant, of course, will depend on n. And we expect this constant to be something like one by n squared. So we expect this to grow something like nx to the five by six, because we kind of, we, 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 we have heuristics for how n, n delta grows. So we expect this to grow something like nx to the five by six divided by n squared because the probability that e belongs to en we expect to be something like one by n squared. And very, it's, it's, it's nice to note that this sum actually converges, the sum of n actually converges. And so we end up with something that still looks like x to the five by six. We're not, we're not getting a higher order of growth for nc. Um, and we would still expect it to grow something like x to the five by six. So this conjecture is implicit in the work of Watkins, who computes the probability that E is inside En. Um, and here's what the conjecture is. It's that NCx grows like this explicit constant times x to the five by six. And this, you can, you can, the, 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 this, this explicit con constant has also been computed by Watkins. Okay, so I just want to write this out here as well, and just point out a sort of a sort of parallel that that is going to continue. Like throughout this talk, I sort of want to talk about ordering curves by discriminant and ordering curves by conductor, and sort of point out certain parallels between these questions. So, so if, so what we have here is is n 
C um, X E equals summation. So this is actually just definitely true. N C X E N, which which we can write as summation n greater than or equal to one, as, as n greater than or equal to one, n delta n x e n. Okay, and what I want to say is that so we have here we have something that looks like um, so we have we have n delta x e n plus n delta, sorry, x e1 plus n delta x e2 plus dot, 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 dot. And there's a sort of analogy between points inside when ordering by discriminant points that, that are moving to the right of this, of, this, uh, of this region. So points with very large height, but small discriminant. And there's an analogous thing here of what's happening when n is large. So when n is large, we're talking about points where the discriminant is much larger than the conductor. And that's somehow an analogous problem to counting points to the right of this region where we are counting points with very large height, but small discriminant. So like throughout, I just want to sort of constantly point out the sort of analogs, the, the, the fact that counting by conductors is, is in some sense a periodic analog of, of, of counting uh, a non-Archimedean analog of counting by discriminant. Okay, all right. So that's what we have regarding the heuristics. We, we expect that we know how elliptic curves, uh, what the asymptotics of elliptics are, of elliptic curves are when we order them by discriminant or by conductor. All right, so what is known? So lower bounds are very easy to obtain. Um, if you just count points of small height, if you just count points of height less than as an x to the one plus epsilon, which we can do using just geometry of numbers methods, this immediately gives the correct lower bound for n delta. So that's, that's pretty nice. And if you then want to also count by conductor, if you just sum n delta, or at least the lower bound for n delta, which we can get unconditionally over small n, that gives the correct lower bound for nc. So lower bounds, are unconditionally known and they're fairly easy to obtain. However, upper bounds are much more difficult. So here's what's known as far as upper bounds are concerned. The upper bound n delta x equals big O of x follows from Davenport's work together with work of Delon, Nagel, and Siegel. And when ordering by conductor, uh, the best known result is big O of x to the one plus epsilon and it's due to Duke Kowalski building on work of Brumer Silverman, and I should also say uh, Silverman and Everts. Okay, so let me actually talk a little bit about how these results are proved. So let me start with the first result, which I'll explain in a little more detail than the second one. Um, okay, so, so here's the result, so theorem, n delta, E x is less than less than x. The number of curves when ordered by discriminant uh, with, with discriminant less than x is less than less than x. So let's, let's prove this result. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take our elliptic curve E, which is y squared equals f of x. And we're gonna map it. We're gonna send this to so let's say this cubic polynomial f of x is x cubed plus ax plus b. We're just, gonna, we're just gonna send it to the cubic polynomial, except we'll homogenize it. So we'll send it to x cubed plus axy squared plus by cubed. Um, sorry, I hope it's all visible, excellent. Now let's call the set of all cubic homogeneous polynomials, this is, this is just a binary cubic form. And let's just call the set of all binary cubic forms. Let's just call it U of Z. Well, 
the group GL2Z acts on U of Z by linear change of variables. And so what we have is that we can take our set of elliptic curves, we can map it into U of Z, and then we can further quotient out by GL2Z. So this is a map that makes sense. And we've already seen that the discriminant polynomial on elliptic curves just translates to the discriminant polynomial on binary cubic forms. So work of Davenport counts the number of GL2Z orbits on binary cubic forms with bounded discriminant. So the work of Davenport will say that the number of elements F in UZ mod GL2Z such the discriminant of f is less than x, that this is actually less than less than x. So then what we need to do is we need to study the fibers of this map. We need to understand, given a GL2Z orbit of binary cubic forms, how many different elliptic curves correspond to it. So all we have to do is answer the question, how large are the fibers? And the point is that if you take a GL to Z orbit of, an, of a binary cubic form f of x comma y, the set of elliptic curves corresponding to it, corris this corresponds to a solution of the Thew equation, because you have to make the first coefficient of f of x comma y to be one, and that exactly corresponds to a, thew, to a solution to the Thew equation. So the elliptic curves, so the fibers, correspond to r comma s in z squared, such that f of r comma s equals one. And what we know by work of Siegel, as well as work of, so let me just switch back to the slide. This is unfortunate, uh, but, but what we know is work of Delon, Nagel, and Siegel. Uh, it, it, it proves that, 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 the number of th that the number of solutions to the Thew equation is absolutely bounded. And so, um, and so we're done. So we know that the number, of the number of orbits of binary cubic forms is less and less than x. And what we know is the number of five, the size of the fibers is less and less than one, I think less than, Certainly less than 12 is true. I think that's been improved subsequently and it's possibly less than seven now, but the number of fibers is less than less than one. And so that proves the number of elliptic curves with discriminant less than X is bounded by big O of X. Okay. Um, so that's, that's the full proof of that result. And now let me just move on to the other result. This is due to Duke and Kowalski. And what they prove is that the number of elliptic curves with conductor less than x is less and less than x to the one plus epsilon. So this is a somewhat different proof, but I will at least sketch how, how this proof goes. It's also very beautiful. It's a, it's a different strategy. So what you do here is you say, look, if you have the discriminant of an elliptic curve and, and, and you know that 1728 times this discriminant is a times d to the six for some integers a and d, then this equation gives an s integral point where s is some finite absolutely bounded set of primes on the elliptic curve ea, which is y squared minus x cubed, y squared equals x cubed minus a. And this is just because the discriminant polynomial on elliptic curves looks very much like the equation of an elliptic curve itself, right? Discriminant is uh, 4a cubed minus 27p squared. So the discriminant polynomial looks like an elliptic curve. And, and, and so if you, have, if you have this equation 1728 times delta e equals a times d to the six, you automatically get an S integral point on this specific elliptic curve ea, which is y squared equals x cubed minus a. And then how they proceed in their proofs is, is given uh, 
a particular value of the conductor, you can write down all possible values of the discriminant up to sixth powers because you don't need just discriminant to be equal to a you can actually have discriminant equals a times d to the six in this equation so you just have to write you write down all possible values of delta up to six powers and there are not so many different values of delta up to six powers this is just like big o of c to the epsilon different values and once you have that, you end up with you end up with something like n c uh, e x is less than less than. It's a sum over certain values of a, uh, and you have to count the number of s integral points in the elliptic curve e a. Now this is of of course not at all an easy task, but there are sort of very deep results of Everts and Silverman. that relate this quantity to the three class group of the field Q square root minus A. And an average size of the three class group of Q square root minus A was computed by, Dav by Davenport Hilbron. And putting all of this together gives the result that um, gives gives the result we're looking for. N C X E is less and less than x to the one plus epsilon. Okay. So all right. So now let me let me move on. Thank you so much. Um, all right. Um, so I just want to point out here that both upper bounds use ineffective results. So we needed, for the first proof, we needed to show that the number of, we needed to bound the number of solutions to the Thew equation. For the second proof, we needed to bound the number of solutions, uh, the number of integer points, the number of S integer points on an elliptic curve. Now these results are ineffective, which is to say, you're never going to use, I mean, the proofs don't, won't be able to tell you that you have zero solutions to a Thew equation. Because the way it works is you say, well, you have, if you have one very large solution, then you can rule out further large solutions. And similarly, to bound, to bound the number of integral points in an elliptic curve, the sort of Diophantine methods, they assume the solution, they assume the existence of a large integer point and use that to bound further for the further points. So the nature of those proofs make improvements very difficult because if you want to improve, for example, on the big O of X result for N delta X epsilon, you're going to have to show that a lot of few equations don't have solutions. And how do you do that? Certainly the sort of the current proofs, they don't, they don't admit such, uh, they don't, they don't admit, um, like, like it's, it's very hard to say that there are zero solutions. Of course, I mean, these results, these results have been effectivized by work of Baker, but like the sort of height bounds, the effective height bounds are just way too large to be, to be currently useful. Okay. Um, okay, so, but, but now that we have these two proofs, I wanna talk about the following related questions, which are also extremely interesting in their own right but they clearly relate to the previous question. So here are some related open questions. Uh, how many binary cubic forms represent one? Um, an equivalent question to this, and I'll explain why it's equivalent in a minute, is that, is, is the question of how many cubic rings are monogenic? So in, in a minute, I'll sort of explain what it means for a cubic ring to be monogenic and why a binary cubic form representing one is the same as a cubic ring being monogenic. But now you can be a little more specific, you can say, how many cubic fields are monogenic? And you can also ask, for example, this, this sort of a second set of questions sort of inspired by the, by the second proof uh, of, for the conductor bound, which is if you have a family of elliptic curves, uh, 
how does the number of integral points of E, how does that function behave as you vary across the family? And here are some results that are known along these directions. So on the elliptic curve, on integer points on the elliptic curve, we had a wonderful lecture by way two weeks ago. And that's somehow, that's, that's an amazing result, uh, which is, which is uh, certainly the best known result that's known, which is that if you look at the full family of elliptic curves, EZ has bounded second moment. I'll point out that that um, that that for the proof of con of, of of ordering curves by uh, conductor, what we we didn't want to look at the full family of elliptic curves. We wanted to look at the we wanted to look only at the elliptic curves EA, which is y squared equals x cubed minus a. But you can ask this question about how does the sort of number of integer points behave for the full family as well? It's completely natural. Wonderful question to ask, and 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 here's here's a great result that's that's known in that direction. Um, if you want to prove that a lot of elliptic curves have no integral points, uh, the sort of most efficient way seems to be to just say that they have rank zero. So a result of 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 Bhargava and myself uh, is that a positive proportion of elliptic curves have rank zero, and therefore they have no integer points. So now let's talk about the other set of questions. So, uh, so we have these two results, Alpo Jho and Bhargavan myself on, on the question of number of integer points in elliptic curves. Um, and, and now let's talk about the cubic rings and, and cubic fields being monogenic. So it's a really nice result by Akhtari and Bhargava that a positive proportion of cubic rings are not monogenic despite having no local obstruction to being monogenic. Um, their, their result did not show that a positive proportion of cubic fields are not monogenic because their result, I mean, they, the way they constructed their positive proportion of cubic rings was looking within suborders of a single cubic field. But there's this recent upcoming result of Alpoj, Bhargava, and Schnidman, which proves that a positive proportion of cubic fields are not monogenic, despite having no local obstruction. Okay, so I have to define monogenic. I have to tell you why a binary cubic form representing one is the same as a cubic ring being monogenic. And then I also want to sort of just talk a little bit about the proof of number four, because it is a really beautiful, beautiful, uh, beautiful idea. Okay, so let's go back to one note uh, and let me try and try and say what this is. So, so, so a ring, let's say of rank n over z, I want it to be finite rank, um, is said to be monogenic if there exists an element in it, such which generates r. So r needs to be z alpha. So that's all it means for a ring to be monogenic. And we see that a number field k is monogenic if OK is monogenic. Okay. Um, so that's all it means for monogenic. So note that all quadratic fields are monogenic. But for cubic fields, the question of are you monogenic or not is a very difficult, very intricate question, which, which, re which, which relates to whether or not a Thue equation, a cubic Thue, Thue equation has a solution. And it's quite simple. The point is that if you have a cubic ring R, then by the delon fadiv correspondence, this produces the GL to Z orbit of a binary cubic form f of x comma y. And what is this f of x comma y? This is simply the index form of R. Namely, if the way you produce this binary cubic form is you look at R, 
you look at r mod z and that's isomorphic to z2 and now you just take the index form on z2 and you get a binary cubic form So in order to be monogenic, you just need your index form to take the value one because that's exactly what it means. You want an element which generates a ring of index one. So R is monogenic if and only if the index form takes the value one, which happens if and only if f of x comma y, which is the index form, a binary cubic form, represents one. So the question of is a binary cubic form uh, does, a, does a binary cubic form represent one is, is, is the same as the question of does, does its associated cubic ring, is its associated cubic ring monogenic? Okay. Um, that's nice. So I, I'll just point out that, that, that sometimes you're not monogenic for local reasons, but the result of uh, Akhtari and, and Bhargava, as well as the result of Alpoj, Bhargava, and Schnidman, actually prove that infinitely many binary cubic forms do not represent one, not just infinitely many, but a positive proportion. But I'll just sort of talk a little bit about the proof of Alpoj, Bhargava, and Schnidman. What they prove is that a positive proportion of cubic fields K are not monogenic. And they do this by studying not just the equation f of x comma y equals one, but f of x comma y equals z cubed and they prove a stronger thing that this has no rational solution. For a positive proportion of, of Fs corresponding to cubic fields. So they're actually proving a stronger result, not just that F of X comma Y doesn't represent one, but that it doesn't actually, that it doesn't represent a cube. Um, and they do that by a sort of very careful analysis of uh, a sort of very beautiful, beautiful proof, sort of using both two descent and three descent on families of elliptic curves. Okay, but what I want to point out is that all four of these proofs, their current proof strategies, even if extended to the absolute maximum, are not going to result in getting to zero percent. So that genuinely seems like a difficult question needing different ideas and different methods. Because I mean, like for example, like point two, a positive proportion of elliptic curves have rank zero and no integral points, but I mean, a positive proportion also have rank one. And I don't think it is known, I'm pretty sure it's not known that you can, that like, for example, here's an open question that I, that I, that I think is open, which is, um, which is if you have, like, are, is, like, if you look at the elliptic curves which have rank one, we know that a, we know by work of uh, Bhargava, Skinner, and Zhang that a positive proportion of elliptic curves have rank, have rank, have rank one. So now you can ask, well, amongst that positive proportion, is it known that a positive proportion of them have no integral points? And I and I and I don't think that's known. So 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 you can't really push two to show that 0% of elliptic curves have integer points, even though that's what should be true. Okay. So now I want to talk about ordering by conductor, which in some sense is more difficult than ordering by discriminant because it incorporates the difficulties of ordering by discriminant within itself. So the two basic difficulties are that you have to rule out elliptic curves which have large height and small discriminant. This is also a difficulty. This is also this is this is the same difficulty that you have when trying to count elliptic curves ordered by 
ordered by discriminant. The problem is you can have curves with large height and small discriminant. And it's hard to, you have, you have elliptic curves with, with large height and small discriminant, and that's why it's hard to count curves with ordered by discriminant. But when ordering by when ordering curves by conductor, you have an extra difficulty, which is you also have to rule out the existence of curves with very large discriminant, but very small conductor. And so what I want to what I want to do um, is is talk about is 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 is, is point out first of all I'll, I'll just point out that issue two is just a non Archimedean version of issue one, namely. The first issue happens when 4a cubed and 27b squared are unusually close, right? You have large height when a and b are large, and you have small discriminant when 4a cubed minus 27b squared is small. So the first thing happens when 4a cubed and 27b squared are unusually close, but the second happens when 4a cubed and 27b squared are unusually close p-adically, that they're divisible by some very large power of p, and that's why the discriminant is large, but the conductor, you drop down the power of p all the way down to one or two, and so the conductor becomes small. So the second issue is just a periodic issue of the first. It's just a non-Archimedean version of the first, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. It doesn't have to just be one prime at which the difference between discriminant and conductor happens. It can happen at multiple different primes. So you could have, uh, so like they could just be one prime, or there could be a whole lot of primes that are forcing your discriminant and conductor to be far apart. And that happens because 4a cubed and 27b squared are unusually close. Okay, so what I want to do next is somehow rule out the first issue and focus entirely on the second. So we've already seen that the first issue is difficult. It relates to questions of counting integer points and elliptic curves. It relates to questions on, on asking how many, uh, on asking for solutions to theory equation on average over binary cubic forms. But now let's try and focus on the second issue while ignoring the first. So how do we rule out the first issue? Well, we just need to rule out elliptic curves which have large height and small discriminant. And we'll do that by taking the following subfamily of elliptic curves. We'll only take those elliptic curves whose J invariants are quite small. So look at those elliptic curves E since the J of E is less than the log of the discriminant. And if you do that, then it automatically, then, then the height of elliptic curves in, in E prime are automatically fairly small. We have height is less and less than discriminant to the one plus epsilon. So you, you've just ruled out the first issue by just throwing out all those curves. And so if you just want to study the second issue, you can just restrict yourself to the family E prime, and then you can just focus on this non-Archimedean version of the first issue. Okay, so what do we have to do to study the non-Archimedean version of the first issue. So again, so let me just go back to the original picture. Um, here is what happens when we order elliptic curves by discriminant. And the problem, the, the difficulty is that they could be points, I'll draw them in blue, far out into the region. And we need to show that that doesn't happen. Over here, we need to show that the contribution of points to the right are small. Over here, when ordering by conductor, we need to show that as n grows large, the contribution is small. So n large is exactly analogous to points with large height and small discriminant. n large just means large discriminant, but small conductor. So what we will need, what we expect is that very small n, n up to x to the epsilon actually give you 100% of your elliptic curves, you want to prove that all the bigger ends are actually not contributing. And to do that, we would want, we, we need a bound on the number of elliptic curves ordered by conductor, but instead of in, in E prime, we just need to consider curves in E n prime and we need to obtain a bound that looks like this. So what we actually need is the following bound. We need to prove that it's less than less than x to the five by six divided by n to the one plus five by six plus delta where delta is any positive constant. So, so if we could actually prove such a bound, then we would be able to determine asymptotics for the number of curves in E prime. I'll note that the truth should be x to the five by six divided by n squared, because that is approximately what the probability looks like. 
Um, so, but we don't need to prove all the way up to n square. If we just prove n to the one plus five by six plus delta, that that would be enough. Okay, but we need this bound to be independent of both n and x, and that's what makes it difficult. You can't just fix n and prove it as x grows. You have to prove it for all pairs x comma n. So bounds of this type are called uniformity or tail estimates, and they actually arise very frequently in different contexts in mathematics. So for example, suppose we have a polynomial with integer coefficients in n variables, then the bound, the number of, you know, number of elements in z to the n such that p squared divides f of v uh, with height less than x, suppose we could prove it's less than less than x to the n divided by p to the one plus delta plus little o of x to the n, then that would automatically imply that we could, we could determine the odds that f takes a square free value. And again, I want to point out that, that, that the truth for the above equation is not merely x to the n divided by p to the one plus delta, it's actually, it should be x to the n divided by p squared, but, but it would be enough to just prove x to the n divided by p to the one plus delta plus little o of x to the n. Now the question that we, the, the bound that we want, equation one in these slides, is actually more difficult. It's a more difficult version of the second displayed equation. And the second, dis and, and, and the difference in them, I, I, I'll tell you the three differences between them. First of all, there's this fudge factor of little o of x to the n that's allowed in the second equation that would absolutely not be enough in the first. Um, there is this, there is the, the, the fact that we need uh, P to the one plus delta is enough while over, while in the first equation we need one plus five by six plus delta makes things significantly more difficult. And finally, and this is also very crucial, when you're trying to determine the odds that F takes a square free value, you only have to prove these estimates for prime P. But in equation one, you have to do it for all integers N, in particular, if you do it for all prime powers, and that makes it much more difficult. I'll also point out, I'll also say one more thing about these uniformity or tail estimates. I mean, just to sort of try and convince you that they, they can get very difficult. Uh, in joint work with Jacob Zimmerman, we proved that if you can actually get precise asymptotics, not just bounds, but actually asymptotics for quantities that are very analogous uh, to NC epsilon and prime X, but sorry, E and prime X, but we actually get them, we get an analogous quantities for higher degree polynomials. Uh, for a fixed degree n, then this would imply Marley's conjecture on counting degree n as n number fields. If you can actually sort of count precisely how many higher degree number fields uh, satisfy certain specified congruence conditions, then you can actually recover Marley's conjecture for degree n as n fields. It's not to say that Marley's conjecture is within reach. It's to say that these tail estimates can get quite difficult. Okay, but this good news, which is that in all these cases, you don't actually need individual bounds. You only need average bounds. Bounds, it's enough to prove bounds on average over n in dyadic ranges. Okay, so now let me then move to uh, the main results, which are, which are very partial results. We, we can prove the uniformity estimate restricting to the case when n is square free. So what we can prove is that on average over square free n, we have the required bound. n c epsilon n prime x, if you sum over n square free, it's less than less than x to the five by six divided by m to the one by six minus epsilon. And this uniformity estimate does have an implication to the statistics of a certain families of elliptic curves ordered by conductor. Remember, we've already restricted our family from E to E prime by throwing out curves which have large height but small discriminant. Um, but this would, this, would, this would be enough to handle the following family. Look at all elliptic curves E and E prime where the discriminant divided by the conductor is square free. Can you remind me what E n prime is? Absolutely. So E n prime, so let me just, uh, let me just go to the to one note because I think navigating slides would be more annoying. So en prime, these are elliptic curves. 
um, whose gene variant are less than the log of their discriminants. Okay. So, I mean, what this, what this does is it exactly rules out curves to the right here. That's, that's just the point of it. It just rules out, it just rules everything to the right out. Uh, we just, we just throwing out curves. We just manually throwing out curves, which have large height and small discriminant. Great. So, but but within within E n prime, we we will if you if you look now at elliptic curves in sorry within E prime, if you look at sorry E n prime is just the intersection of E prime and E n. Uh, sorry, maybe I just misunderstood your question. Uh, sorry, this is E prime, and E n prime is just E n intersect E prime. Um, so now, if we, if you look at if you look at the following family, if you look at E and E prime, since the discriminant divided by the conductor is square free, well, then we can actually determine its asymptotics. So I, I won't write it down. It's, it's, sort of, it's a local product as you would expect, but the asymptotics are as predicted by the heuristics. But we can actually do a bit more. We can actually do arithmetic statistics in this family as well. We can, we, we, we can show that the average size of the two Selma group of curves in in, in, this, in this family is what it should be, namely three. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, great. Okay. So I just want to talk a little bit about the ingredients that are necessary for part B of this result. We've talked a lot about part A, but what would we need for part B? For part B, what we need is an average tail estimate on, again, like, like for part A, we just need an average tail estimate on n e n prime x. Now we need to get uh, an, uh, the same kind of tail estimate, but we have to weigh our elliptic curves by the size of the two Selma groups. So it's a little bit harder instead of just proving that the number of elliptic curves uh, in this set is small, we have to show that the number of elliptic curves weighted by the size of the two Selma groups are actually small. And once we prove such a tail estimate, then the results between, then the sort of, once we prove such a tail estimate, then the sort of machinery that, that was set up, uh, the sort of geometry of numbers machinery set up by Manjit Bhargava, as well as, uh, as, well as the additional machinery set up by, uh, by Bhargava and myself to compute the average size of the two Selma groups and ordered by height. This, this, this such a tail estimate would just fit into that machinery and the rest of the proof would be pretty much formal. So all we really need for part B is this additional uniformity estimate. And I just also want to point out that our proof provides other uniformity estimates, which are also interesting. So for example, we can prove that we can prove a uniformity estimate on the set of, on the set of GL to Z orbits of binary cubic forms, of binary quartic forms when they're, when they're ordered by height. Uh, we can prove a uniformity estimate of this sort. So if you, if you take the number of, if you take the set of binary aquatic forms that correspond to rings that are non-maximal at P, then we can, we can get a uniformity estimate on the sizes of these sets. And these, this is essentially the correct uniformity estimate. Uh, this is, I mean, up to X to the epsilon, this is what should be the best possible. And I just want to sort of point this out because if you want to obtain a secondary main term in the cell to E average, then this would be, this would be a very useful ingredient. Um, okay, so what about the proofs of these uniformity estimates? So the idea of the proof is to somehow, like we have these sets we want to bound, and these sets are sparse because they're defined by congruence conditions modulo very large n. And what we have to do is somehow map these sets into lattices, equip them with a group action, and use the group action to bring the points closer together. And once the points are closer together, you can use geometry of numbers techniques. So let me very briefly in the five or so minutes left, explain how the proofs proceed. So here's, here's, what, here's what we do. We have, we have our elliptic curve E. 
y squared equals f of x. And what we will do, given this elliptic curve, is we will produce the, it's not necessarily a field, it could just be an ethyl extension of Q, but I'm just gonna pretend it's a field for now, that it's, 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 a, it's, it's a cubic field K, which is QX mod F of X. along with an element alpha in the ring of integers. And what's alpha? Well, alpha is just x. And this pair k comma alpha clearly determines e because the characteristic polynomial of alpha determines f of x. Okay. So what we have to do, so now suppose we have what did restricting to this E prime by us, what E prime bought us was that the height of alpha is small or height of alpha can be controlled. So we're not getting huge elements alpha inside okay, we're getting fairly small elements which can be counted. Okay, but now we're also, we want a bound not just on E prime but a bound on E n prime. So what does it mean for E to be in E n prime? And here it's very crucial that we assume that n is square free. And of course we want it for large n. For small n you can actually count by hand. It's only for large n that we have to worry. So what this implies is that the number field K actually satisfies something. So it satisfies one of two properties. Either its discriminant is small or the shape of the ring of integers is very skewed. And what do I mean when I say the shape is skewed? Look at OK mod Z. Well, as a lattice that's, oh dear. As a lattice that's Z squared, and let's take a Minkowski basis for it. This is the Minkowski basis. So what it means when, I, what I mean when I say the shape of OK is skewed is to say that the size of V2 divided by the size of V1 is large. And in fact, the shapes of OK, like suppose discriminant of K is not small, the shapes of OK will be so skewed that they'll pull out a very thin set. They'll pull out a sort of very thin set inside the shape of, inside the space of shapes. So this actually is a very thin set within the space of shapes. And so what we have to do, if we want to bound, if we want to bound the number of elements in En prime with conductor less than X, so bounds on En prime will correspond to counting lattice points in cuspidal regions of what we've already seen, UR mod GL2R. So this is the space of binary cubic forms. It admits an action by GL to Z. There's a fundamental domain for this action. And what we have to do to count these points of, of very skewed shape is to count inside the cuspidal regions of this shape, inside the space. And that, that's what a bound on NC EN prime X corresponds to. Except you have to count not just the forms, but you have to weigh by the number of possible alphas that show up. So that's an extra wrinkle, but, but yes. So, so it, it essentially corresponds to counting points in these sort of skewed regions. And if you're also interested in knowing how in, 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 in bounding these elliptic curves, but actually weighted by the two Selmer groups. So now we don't just want to bound, we don't just want to count the number of elliptic curves E, which we're doing by counting K comma alpha, 
but we want to weigh E by the size of the two Selmer group, what you have to do is you just assume that, you sorry, you just use the fact that the two Selmer group of such an elliptic curve is controlled by the two torsion in the class group of the corresponding field. And then you use the fact that we know how to parameterize the two class group of K again by, by, work, of, by work of Bhargava. So I'm out of time. I will stop now and take questions. Thank you, Arul. Thank you. Well, who would like to start with the questions? I have a question. Okay. Can you say something more about how the ratio, when you were talking at the end about the lattice shape being very skewed, how does that use that n as a square? Is is a square free? And yeah. Oh no! So so sorry. So 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 the the sh the shape does not automatically. I mean, what what actually happens is that is that when n is square free, you have a good control over the discriminant of k, and you need to know whether you have an integer alpha of the correct height as well. So you need to show that you don't have too many alphas corresponding to a k. So for example, if your discriminant isn't too small, you expect your alphas to be quite big and therefore not too many alphas will show up. But on the other hand, you could run into a situation where your discriminant of k is, is fairly large, but you have a very small alpha corresponding to it, that will give you a lot of elliptic curves just through its multiples. But if that is to happen, then the shape has to be very skewed. So the point is that if, 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 if the discriminant of k is not, is not small, you just won't have any alphas corresponding to elliptic curves in En prime, unless your shape is very skewed in which case you could have them, but your shape being very skewed will rule out, will, will help you cut down the number of fields that exist. Ah, uh, thanks. Sorry, can you say again, so why, what goes wrong if n is a square or has square factors? So if n is a, if n has square factors, then you can say nothing about the discriminant of your, of your field. Your discriminant of your field could be as large. So, so we're trying, so let's say you're trying to bound conductor less than x. If n has square factors, you will get lots of points where the discriminant is actually x. And then the total number of fields is x. And then you have to additionally weight with the number of alphas and so on that show up. But, but that's, that's just like, you're not, you're not gonna do much better than x in that case. We, we can get some partial results in the case when n is a square, we can go n up to like x to the seven by eight, we can sum it up, but, but n being as, I mean, what we're trying to like, like what we're doing here is essentially converting this non-Archimedean condition of belonging to en prime. So like belonging to en prime is very, is very much a non-Archimedean condition. It's, it's determined by divisibility of the coefficients by powers of n, okay? Now, we don't just want, we don't, it's, it's, it's very crucial for us that it's not just one En prime that you have to bound, but you can average over En prime over N. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to convert that condition of you belong to En prime for some large N into an Archimedean condition so that you can apply geometry of numbers. Now, when N is square free, you can do that. When N is a perfect square, like if N is just running through P squared, for example, that becomes, like maybe there's a way to do it, but certainly this way to do it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't pan out. You've got to do something different. Thanks, let's see, any other questions? Well, this is Rachel. Could you say a little bit more about the connection with Mala's conjecture? Oh, absolutely. No, no, the connection was, was, to, was to what's happening with, uh, with, with uniformity estimates. So, I mean, suppose you look, suppose you fix a degree D. So I think my slide there was completely mangled because I used N in two different contexts. So apologies for that. But let's fix a degree D. 
let's say it's greater than or equal to 3 um and now and now what we will have like you can define so now let's look at the space of monic degree d polynomials which is very similar to the space of elliptic curves when d is 3 now you can define inside vz certain sets en prime and what we prove this is joint work with jacob simerman is that if you can actually if you can do we need much more than just a bound on en prime we need we need precise asymptotics on em prime on average over n precise asymptotics on average over n would imply marley's conjecture for sd basically again this 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 en prime is defined by some sort of index condition it's this en prime is defined by something like if you take a polynomial f of x inside vz and if you look at this f of x is going to give you a number field k it's also going to give you a degree n ring a degree d ring r and if you look at the index of r inside ok and you set it to be n that's approximately what en prime is and it's very similar to the en prime in our case as well and precise asymptotics for en prime would would imply uh, we show would imply marley's conjecture for sd oh thank you